I'm glad to be joined by Bert Hoffman, director of the East Asian Institute at National University of Singapore and former country director of China for the World Bank. Meanwhile, we are joined in Los Angeles, William Lee, chief economist with the Milken Institute. Last but not least, in Beijing, Xu Qiang, assistant director of the International Monetary Institute at the Renmin University of China. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. I will start by asking all of you, what are your general impressions of the latest uh, readout by the Central Work Committee? Uh, Mr. Hoffman, please. Overall, there's a bit of a different tone from last year. I think there's a good recognition that the, the problems that were recognized last year, the three downward pressures, haven't gotten any better. And so I think there's more positive policy signaling uh, to help solve the problems. There's a broad signaling of, of, of reform direction, which of course follows up on the 20th Party Congress. Uh, but also there's some, some old themes of reform and opening are more emphasized, including that the practice is the sole guide of uh, policy uh, effectiveness. Uh, specifically, I feel that the emphasis on the development of the private sector is important. Uh, so um, the, um, before there was some debate on whether China would still support the private sector, I think there's a lot of emphasis on that, the encouragement of the of the private sector and encouragement of foreign direct investment. So I think these are some of the important takeaways for me. Mm. Mr. Li, what about your perspective? Hearing the echoes of Deng Xiaoping's cross the river by touching the stones uh, is something that we in the West would be relieved by. As, and the other message that uh, uh, President Xi wants to uh, improve the conditions for foreign capital to come into China is a very welcome message, considering all of the discussion about uh, common prosperity and and, um, and dual circulation strategies that implied a more closing of foreign capital or a redirection of foreign capital toward the, the, the building of national champions. Uh, now that uh, it seems that the recovery phase uh, in this post-COVID environment is going to really depend on not just it boosting domestic demand, but will also require foreign capital to participate is a very welcome message. As Bert had just mentioned, yes, private sector has been uh, re-stressed. This is uh, actually very important. And actually, about real estate market, uh, it made it very clear that it's going to stabilize the whole sector because it's a pillar of the national economy. And more importantly, it's a stabilizer. Education uh, sector, for example, the private education or uh, like the tutoring uh, businesses, uh, they probably is going to face some new version of the policies. So this is going to be very interesting. And also, uh, like William just mentioned, uh, open up more for the foreign capitals that welcome more of the foreign investors to come into China. I think all this is going to create more of the jobs in the next year. And the jobs means more income and income means consumption, and which is the key uh, in this report and the conference. Mm. Another point, it seems that uh, Mr. Hoffman being mentioned that is create jobs for the younger generation. Now, with the world economy suffering and China very connected to the world and also its growth rate goes slowing down over the past few week, uh, few years, how do you look at this uh, factor? You're absolutely right. I think it's a very important factor in the decision making. And if you look at the new generation coming onto the market, where currently youth unemployment is relatively high, they're very well trained. A lot of them have a university education. And so they're looking for much more sophisticated jobs than the previous generation. Uh, previously, they really found that in a lot in uh, those sectors that are not doing so well at, the, at, at this point in time. And that is on in the platform economy, in finance, and in real estate. So I think the emphasis on those sectors, especially on the platform economy, is going to be positive for creating a lot of jobs in the services sector uh, that, that would be good for graduates. In addition, the on the demand side, the emphasis on, on increased consumption, not just in this document, but also in the joint document by the state <clears throat> council and the central committee on promoting consumption, I think will benefit the services sector uh, a lot in the recovery from COVID that we expect in the coming months to evolve. 
Hmm. Another thing is we see the shifting of uh, the anti-COVID policy over the past few weeks all over China. Now we see some cities uh, already developing certain levels of herd immunity, if I could use this big word. Of course, there's still a way to go, a long way to go. Uh, but uh, Professor Chu, how do you see uh, this factor is likely to have its a different directional impact on the recovery of the economy? I think uh, Eastern Asian societies share a lot of similarity. Uh, if you take a look at the curve of uh, uh, South Korea and Japan and uh, Taiwan, China and Hong Kong region, uh, you will find that they probably have the similar pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, when they open up uh, fully in the first stage, uh, everything is gonna shrink. Uh, people just to hide at home. Um, people try to avoid get a contact with people and the service business is facing a disaster. So it's a shrinking situation. The GDP is falling, consumption is falling. But after like uh, two or three months or faster, like in Singapore situation, maybe one or two months uh, because they're smaller. So uh, everything started a very sharp rally and you're gonna see a very, very quick rebounds of the consumptions and the business activities in the coming uh, quarter. Basically there is uh, one of the assumption is that China will also share the same similarity, but uh, it's gonna be very quick rebound after probably uh, the March of the next year, but also you're not going to expect a crazy re rebound or much higher than the pre-COVID years, uh, like in 2019. And because people still get afraid. And in China right now, we still have, we still have been jumped with this COVID. So people are still uh, fighting with the situation, mm -hmm. uh, you know, sniveling, coughing. So I think this kind of uh, expectation is going to last. So much higher uh, than this three years, but uh, still a bit lower than the pre-COVID. Mr. Li, talking about foreign investment, we did see uh, quite some emphasis on uh, deepening the reform in China and also going to higher levels of opening up. Of course, that phrase has been mentioned in the 20s uh, MP, uh, CPC National Congress several times, uh, but and now under the new circumstances, this higher level of opening up, attracting foreign investment, what does that mean to you uh, if you are looking at next year's plan uh, as uh, many foreign companies are certainly doing right now? Uh, Professor Xi talked about a profile of recovery, which is essentially the consensus view. Uh, there'll be a slowdown as people get sick, but as people recover, there's going to be a very rapid rebound, as we've seen in many of the other countries, especially here in the U.S., um, where uh, people will just have an enormous desire to travel, engage in services, go out to restaurants. I, I as a foreign investor, uh, one of the things that, that we always caution in, in, in consensus outlooks would be what are the tail risks? And I think one of the tail risks that we have to talk about very seriously would be whether or not the Chinese consumer is going to be able to have that burst of consumption when the property market is still in some disarray, the value of their wealth is still uncertain. Um, and then uh, for as for income, their children are not able to get jobs that have permanent income associated with it. When there's that kind of uncertainty about wealth and income, that might put a big damper on the amount of recovery. And if there's a damper on the amount of recovery and the, the growth of the domestic market, foreign investors would be very reluctant to come in because China's growth may not be anywhere near expectations. And that's going to be something that the Western investors will be watching very carefully. A lot of Chinese consumers, Mr. Hoffman, if I get the sense of what's going on, is um, much more uh, realistic and much less swayed by advocacy. Especially one could uh, notice that over the past uh, couple of months. How do you understand the stability of growth and the recovery of the economy now in China? Uh, no, I, th I, think, I think you're right. Uh, th I think the basis for a sustained recovery, a more consumer-driven 
growth in the future, uh, we, we, we don't find that in the Central Economic Work Conference. That's, that's not the purpose of it. It's about stabilization of expectations for next year. And I think Professor Chu and Lee have covered that well. Beyond that, it's indeed this longer term outlook of the Chinese consumer and investor for that matter, uh, is what's going to happen next. And are we regaining a sustained growth path in the order of five, maybe even more percent over time? That depends a lot on reforms that should underpin some of, some of that growth. And frankly, again, this is the, the meeting that we just had was not the place. It would be a reform meeting of the Central Committee somewhere in the coming year that would spell out that medium term growth path and that medium term reform path that would match that. Mm. Some of those aspects of these reforms will stimulate consumption, including a stronger safety net, including a further, further reform in the HUCO, the household registration system, so that people can be more mobile, look for the jobs where they're most productive. A, a, a change in the housing system, how the housing market is going to land and what new structure of the property market is going to be like is going to be very important. Hmm. Another factor in, uh, that will have a big impact on Chinese economy is the so-called uh, external situation. And now, Mr. Li, I go to your expertise on that. How do you see uh, when China mentioned the external environment? It's without a doubt that Europe, the United States are headed toward a recession. The question is how deep a recession, how long a recession. And that is bad news for China because the West is the major source of Chinese exports, which would help bolster the recovery in, in, in China. Uh, and that's why most analysts uh, that I know who look at China essentially knock out any kind of external stimulus helping China. China's recovery will be based on domestic demand and domestic monetary fiscal policy, being able to stabilize financial markets, stabilize the wealth, reassure people that their sources of income are, are in place. Uh, it, with, with the uh, war in Russia going on, um, it is without a doubt energy prices will continue to, to be incredibly volatile and, and, and probably going up. Um, and many of the emerging market countries, um, which are also part of China's ecosystem, are in dire straits in terms of food security. Uh, lots of food prices have gone up, uh, and 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 part of the Chinese um, uh, supply chain of having raw materials come in from these emerging markets uh, might also be quite disrupted because COVID is still uh, a problem there. But also the high interest rates uh, have prevented foreign investments from really re, uh, resuming in these emerging market economies. So, so China will be facing enormously challenging uh, external environments for the next year or so. Uh, and, and, and that's why I think the recovery for China is gonna depend much more on its own domestic policies. And on, on that, mm. I, I would have one word of caution, uh, which we haven't mentioned yet. One of the strategies that's been talked about would be to have local governments issue debt to finance a lot of the needed fiscal policy to give the safety net to, to try to boost domestic demand. Uh, the danger there is that if you issue local government debt um, and you don't fix the property markets, which is the main source of revenues for the local governments, there's going to be a vicious decaying circle of bad debt quality. And that would frighten, I think, a lot of U.S. investors and, and, and Western investors in general about the sustainability of the domestic revival. There is a big debate going on, as you know, Mr. Chu, in China about uh, whether China should be even more competitive as an exporter. Now, there are different reasons why that debate happening today. One of it is uh, looking at the stories that we see these days in the media, for example, from some of the export-driven provinces, Zhejiang, uh, Jiangsu, Sichuan, and some of the others, uh, going now in uh, uh, planes, plane loads of uh, business people running to um, North America, to Europe as well, just to what they call dan, actually to compete for the contract for next year, even though it's already the holiday season. So. Uh, there is debate about whether that is the most, uh, uh, the best practice, 
because some argue in China, with the world's economy being unstable, uh, countries are competing for contracts. That's for sure. It does not mean China should be less competitive, but China should leave some space for the others also, given the ever more unpredictable geopolitical situations. Uh, however, others argue China should grasp any opportunity that it has at this moment and be competitive in whichever way it is possible. Um, so, Professor Chu, how do you see this debate? Well, should Mbappe give the championship to Macy because Macy probably is older? Or should Macy just give it up to Mbappe because Mbappe really deserve it? No, it's a game. It's a sport. It's a fair play. Everybody play by rules. So who's going to be the winner? Who's going to be the winner? It's a free market. It's a free trade. Nobody forces you to buy or sell anything, right? So if Chinese people can sell their product and if the world market really needs it, you can go for it. But my view is that uh, this kind of argument is not the real key problem. The problem is, uh, should we, what we should do right now, uh, all those, uh, the export sectors going out of China try to fight for more of the order, is because uh, in many other sectors inside of China, for example, like the catering business and hospitalities, they've been just wetting through the winter. They don't have much of the space or potential to open up or increase that fast. So uh, you, you cannot rely on them uh, in the short term. Mr. Hoffman. Look, for, first, as countries grow richer, which China does, their share of exports in the economy is declining. And that's not a loss of competitiveness, but it's if you want a gain of purchasing power of domestic households. So that's a good thing. Second, uh, as Professor Chu said, a lot of the adjustments are going to be company driven. So it's companies that still try to export, serve their old markets or find new markets and adjust their production processes such that they can live with the higher wages domestically and live with a different demand internationally. And that's technological progress. And that's a good thing as well. Bert Hoffman, William Lee and Chu Chang. Gentlemen, thank you.